It's not easy being the son of a man who many consider to be the father of your nation. One who basically took a petty vassal kingdom and turned it into the greatest empire that the world until then had ever seen. Not to mention being called the Lord's anointed by the writers of the Hebrew Bible. All that pressure can really make one go mad. This is essentially what, at least according to some ancient writers, happened to Cambyses II, the son of the Achaemenid Persian king, Cyrus the Great. But was this true? Or were Greek and Roman writers simply tarnishing his name based on what they'd heard from others who may have been disillusioned with Persian rule of their respective countries? Let's find out as we take a closer look at who Cambyses II, the son and successor of Cyrus the Great, really was. The death of Cyrus the Great in 530 BC was a pretty big deal. According to most sources, he died a warrior's death attempting to pacify Central Asian steppe tribes that were harassing his northeastern borders. But before this, he had brought a relatively poor and unknown group of people, the Persians, onto the world stage by creating the largest and most powerful empire of its day. Though he accomplished this with a mighty military machine, his manner of conquest and governing was in stark contrast to many of the rulers who had come before him. Once he took them over, the kingdoms that he conquered were more or less left to live life as they always had, save for paying their share of taxes to the Persian crown. Upon Cyrus's death, his eldest son, Cambyses, became the new king of kings. Cambyses, though, is the Greek version of his name. In Old Persian, it's Kambugia. The second of his name in the Achaemenid line, Cyrus had been grooming Cambyses for the position since he made him king of Babylon shortly after his conquest of the city. According to the Nabonidus Chronicle, Cambyses appeared jointly with Cyrus in 538 BC at the Babylonian New Year Festival, the most important and auspicious celebration in Mesopotamia at the time. Many scholars believe that this may have been an early indication of Cyrus's intention to name Cambyses as his successor. Cyrus's other son, Bardia, was given jurisdiction of several eastern provinces in Central Asia, with the added bonus of not having to send any tax revenue to the central government. This was probably one of the ways that Cyrus tried to ensure that the two brothers wouldn't fight after his death. Similar to his father, Cambyses also took up more military campaigns to expand the borders of the Persian Empire. Though Cyrus had taken the kingdoms of Lydia and Babylon, he also had plans to conquer Egypt. All three of these nations in the past had allied against him, though he never actually faced the Egyptians head-on in battle. He died before that happened. Thus, the task of conquering Egypt passed on to Cambyses. It's believed that the preparations for the invasion of Egypt took four years. Unlike the Babylonians, who had surrendered their capital without a fight, the Egyptians would not be so easy to subdue. In order to give his army the best chance of success, Cambyses' Persian and Median soldiers trained extra hard to get used to the terrain in Egypt and also hired some of the best Greek mercenaries to join them. In addition, the Persians cooperated with Arab and other tribes who lived in or close to the Sinai Peninsula in order to help with the logistics of crossing the harsh desert into Egypt. Not only did he work with various groups outside of Egypt, but also with those from within. Similar to the case of Babylon before Cyrus took over the city, the priests of Egypt were also at odds with their ruler, Amasis II. Cambyses took advantage of this and launched a propaganda campaign against Amasis, eventually gaining the support of many important priests and nobles within Egyptian society. However, just before Cambyses launched his invasion, Amasis II died. His son, Samtik III, took over the throne, but he was unprepared for the advancing Persian army. The two sides fought outside the town of Pelusium in 525 BC, the result being that the Egyptian army was decisively defeated and eventually, Samtik III was captured. According to Herodotus, he was put under house arrest, but later on attempted to stage a revolt against Persian rule. When Cambyses found out about the plot, he had Samtik executed. 
After consolidating his hold on Egypt, Cambyses decided to subdue the surrounding areas. Sources tell us that he launched an expedition to take the oasis of Siwa, but a massive sandstorm is said to have swooped in and swallowed up his forces while they were en route. Despite this, the Persians were able to take or at least exact tribute from Libya relatively easily. Cambyses also had planned to take Carthage, but his navy, whose sailors were mostly made up of Phoenicians, refused because they didn't want to fight against their own kin. As many of you may know, Carthage was originally a colony that had been founded by traders from the Phoenician city of Tyre. The other big regional campaign was to subdue Nubia and the kingdom of Kush. According to Herodotus, this campaign proved to be extremely costly. Unlike the well-planned campaign to cross the Sinai, Cambyses' men ran out of supplies and food, with things apparently getting so bad that some of the Persians are said to have resorted to cannibalism. However, other texts seem to contradict this and imply that Cambyses may have at least left a garrison there. The Greek geographer and historian Strabo writes, Moreover, when Cambyses conquered Egypt, he advanced with the Egyptians as far as Meroe. In fact, it is said the name was given by him to both the island and the city because his sister, Meroe, died there. I don't think there's any scholar who can confirm from any other source, let alone through archaeology, that Meroe, the capital of the Kushite kingdom and later empire for hundreds of years, was founded by Cambyses II. However, this story is in contrast to Herodotus' claim of a totally disastrous campaign to take Kush, and at least seems to indicate some sort of success and perhaps a Persian presence there. The 1st century BC Greek historian Diodorus Siculus also indicates that, far from resorting to cannibalism, Cambyses' Persian forces actually brought back new types of exotic foods from Kush, which he calls Ethiopia. In his writings, he states, There are also in Egypt many kinds of trees, of which one called Persia, which was introduced from Ethiopia by the Persians when Cambyses conquered these regions, has an unusually sweet fruit. Herodotus is rather blunt when describing Cambyses' mental state. I am convinced by all the evidence that Cambyses was seriously deranged, he writes in the histories. As a matter of fact, Cambyses is said to have had a certain serious illness from birth, which some call the sacred disease. In any case, it would not be at all improbable that someone who had a serious illness of the body would also suffer from an unhealthy mind. Throughout the histories, Herodotus tells us that Cambyses committed all sorts of despicable acts while in Egypt, including mocking his new subjects' religious customs, desecrating their temples, indiscriminately killing their priests, and most notorious of all, personally stabbing the sacred Apis Bull, believed by pious Egyptians to have been the physical manifestation of the god Ta, the patron deity of craftsmen and architects. Occurring shortly after his disastrous Nubian campaign, Herodotus' account of the Apis Bull event goes something like this. After Cambyses arrived back at Memphis, an epiphany of Apis occurred among the Egyptians. As soon as this epiphany occurred, the Egyptians put on their finest clothes and began to celebrate a festival. When Cambyses observed the Egyptians celebrating, he strongly suspected that they were rejoicing at his miserable military failure, and he summoned the governors of Memphis to his presence. When they arrived, he asked them why the Egyptians had not celebrated any comparable festivities when he had been in Memphis before, but were reveling now when he had returned, losing the greater part of his army. They told him that the god, whose epiphany customarily occurred rarely and at long intervals, and that all Egyptians joyously participated in a festival whenever he appeared. Upon hearing this, Cambyses asserted that they were lying, and that his custom was to punish liars with death. So he killed them all, and then summoned the priests into his presence. 
When the priest replied to him in just the same way, he said that if some benign god had arrived among the Egyptians, he was not going to miss seeing him. And so they ordered the priests to bring Apis to him. And they went to get him. The priest led Apis to Cambyses. And he, being somewhat insane, drew his dagger and struck it in the thigh, although he had aimed for its belly. Then he burst out laughing and said to the priests, You are pathetic people. Is this what your gods are like, flesh and blood, that can feel the prick of iron? Well then, this god is worthy of you Egyptians. But do not think you will get away with making me a laughingstock. Herodotus actually gives many other examples of Cambyses' cruelty, and it's very possible that there may have been some truth to these tales. However, we also have to consider Herodotus' sources for such tales. For example, it's hardly surprising that many of his Egyptian sources would have had some bias. Known throughout history as being an extremely proud and historically xenophobic people, many Egyptians no doubt would have despised living under Persian rule, and of course, would have hated Cambyses, the man who ultimately had conquered them. Thus, Herodotus' sources may have understandably been biased against their new foreign pharaoh. Despite this, there are more measured accounts of Cambyses and his rule that seem to contradict Herodotus. One of these comes from a man named Uja Horesnet, who during the reigns of Cambyses' predecessors, pharaohs Amasis II and Samtik III, multitasked as an admiral, physician, and priest of the Egyptian goddess, Neith. After the Persians conquered Egypt in 525 BC, Uja Horesnet became an influential advisor and sometime physician to both Cambyses II and his successor, Darius I. In a very famous statue from a temple in Sais, now in the Vatican Museum, Uja Horesnet tells us the following about his foreign patron. It's a very long inscription, but some of the parts concerning the Persian King of Kings go like this. The great chief of all foreign lands, Cambyses, came to Egypt. He gained majesty of this land in its entirety. They established themselves in it, and he was great ruler of Egypt, and great chief of all foreign lands. His majesty assigned me the office of chief physician. He made me live at his side as friend and administrator of the palace. I composed his titulary in his name of King of Upper and Lower Egypt. The king of Upper and Lower Egypt came to Sais. His majesty betook himself to the temple of Neith. He touched the ground before her very great majesty, as every king had done. He organized a great feast of all good things for Neith, the Great One, the Mother of God, and the great gods who are in Sais, as every excellent king had done. His majesty completed all that is useful in the temple of Neith. He established the libation for the Lord of Eternity in the Temple of Neith, as every king did earlier. That did his majesty do, because I caused him to recognize how everything useful had been fulfilled in this temple by every king, because of the importance of this temple, for it is the place of all the gods who live eternally. Uja Horesnet basically wrote that Cambyses was actually quite respectful towards the goddess Neith, and that he also carried out his required duties of a pharaoh with regard to the deity's temple. This is in contrast to the account of Herodotus. The same may also be the case with the Apis bull. A limestone stele that was found at the sarcophagus of the bull states, King of Upper and Lower Egypt, son of Ra, Cambyses. May he live forever. He has made a fine monument for his father, Apis Osiris, with a great granite sarcophagus, dedicated by the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, son of Ra, Cambyses. May he live forever, in perpetuity and prosperity, full of health and joy, appearing as king of Upper and Lower Egypt eternally. This, and other inscriptions like it, with regard to the Apis bull, are just a few more shreds of evidence that Cambyses, perhaps, was not as cruel as Herodotus and others may have initially led us to believe. 
At least in these instances, Cambyses' actions seem to have been more in line with those of his father, especially with regard to religious tolerance and respect for the customs of the conquered. Cambyses is said to have spent three to four years in Egypt. Since most of the information that we have about him comes from this time period, it's easy to overlook the fact that he was also the king of Persia and the rest of the Persian Empire. It's during his absence from Persia that unrest broke out in many of the core parts of the empire, and he was summoned home to quash multiple rebellions throughout the realm. He never got there, as upon his return journey, he died, supposedly of a stab wound that some sources claim was self-inflicted, while others murder. The death of Cambyses II is one of the greatest mysteries and controversies in all of ancient history, and some scholars believe that it may have involved a man who would eventually go on to become one of the most powerful kings of all time, Darius the Great. We'll cover this possible conspiracy and later on the life of Darius the Great in the next few installments of the history of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Stay tuned. Thanks so much for stopping by, I really appreciate it. If you learned something or simply just enjoyed the video, please don't hesitate to hit that like button because it helps the channel out a lot. Also, check out the History with Sai podcast where I go into more detail with regard to some of the topics discussed on the channel. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thanks again, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Take care and stay safe.